ცოტა უცნაური ფაქტი ისე ეს რომ გადავწყვიტე და პრეზენტაცია ინგლისურად ჩამეტარებინა და მინდოდა ყველას ვისმე თქვა რატო გადავწყვიტე ეს და რატო ურჩევ სხვა ყველას რომ იგივე გადაწყვეტილება მიიღოს ნუ პასუხი ძალიან მარტივია ჩემი აზრით ტექში ვინმეს რამ ვინმე რამეს თუ წარმოადგენს და რამე თუ იცის მინიმუმ ინგლისური ყველა მიცის ამიტომ რაღაცა სათქმელი თუ გაქვს ძალიან მარტივია უნდა შეეცადო რომ აჩელება მეტ ხალხს უთხრა შენი სათქმელი ამ შემთხვევაში მე რო პრეზენტაცია ქართულად ჩამეტარებინა ბევრად ნაკლები ხალხი გაიგებდა ეხლა ჩვენ ამას ვიწერთ შემდეგ YouTube-ზე დავდებთ და ამიტომ ინგლისური ბუნებრივი ვარიანტი სხვა სპიკერებს უსმენდი და როგორ უჭირდათ ხოლმე ინგლისური ტერმინოლოგიის ქართულად გადმოთარგმნა და ჩემი აზრით პრეზენტაციების ქართულად გაკეთება არც ისე ეფექტური საშუალება და ყველას გირჩევდით რომ ინგლისურად გაკეთებინეთ მაგრამ ეს ჩემი სუბიექტური აზრია კარგი თქვენ შორს რო არ წავიდეთ დავიწყოთ hi i'm sandro and uh, i was explaining in georgian why i decided to use english uh, a small tldr is that english is de facto standard uh, for tech so i decided to make this talk in english uh, i want to apologize for the name of this talk because this is not the first second but the third name the original name was topology then i decided i wanted to call something fancy so i called it plumbing but in the end i wanted the name of the talk to reflect what the talk was actually about so i changed it to structure and today i'm going to talk about structure oh sorry about that uh this since this talk is quite short it's only for 30 minutes i would kindly ask all of you who have any questions to ask them in the end both georgian and english are fine we can have a discussion in either language so let's get started uh throughout this talk i want to and this clicker is not working just give me a second uh okay uh, never mind i'll i'll do this with my hand So during this 30 minutes I'll try to talk about the systems and I'll tr I'll try to give you a few examples to show you why I think that the most important part of the system is a structure. So everything goes back around uh, 10 years ago. Uh 10 years ago I was applying for leadership school and I had an interview and during an interview an interviewer asked me a very simple question. The question was what are your strong suits? What do you believe that you're best at? What do you think distinguishes you from everyone else? And I gave the interviewer a very simple answer. I said, I know the value of structured information. And the interviewer was very surprised and asked me, what do you mean by that? I'm, I, I'm not really sure what you mean. So I told him the example of allotropy. If we take diamond on one hand and graphite on the other hand, they are very different. Diamond is very strong and very precious. Since it's very rare, therefore it's very expensive. Uh, also, it is a very good electrical insulator. It does not conduct electricity. If we look at graphite, on the other hand, it, it has a much weaker structure. It's very malleable. That's why we use it in pencil production. Uh, it's very cheap, very abundant, it, and it's a very good electrical conductor, unlike diamond. But if we zoom in and if, if we look at those two elements, we will very soon realize that they're composed of exactly same building blocks, carbon. But what sets them apart is their unique crystallic structure. So allotropy is a phenomenon when different structure yields different results. And actually scientists know a way how to take graphite as an input and produce diamond as an output. Although to be fair that method is quite costly because it takes a lot of energy but still it's possible. So then when I was thinking about diamond I had a question. So what makes diamond a diamond? Obviously the building block is not a good answer because graphite and diamond are basically the same thing if we look at just the building blocks and then i went slightly philosophical and existential and i had the question what makes me me and i had a small crisis but soon i solved the problem and i realized that what makes diamond unique or what makes me unique is my structure so my identity derives from my structure so if we look at if we know the structure we'll know the identity so to give you a more techy analogy if we could somehow take the human human body and we if we can scan it and take it into bits and we if we could represent in binary and then we took the hash of it we would uh, and we took the hash the identity would be that hash because uh, uh by definition identity is something that derives from the structure so unless structure changes our identity should not change and also to uh, to think about identity in space and time there's the interesting question so uh, uh how can i be sure that me right now is the same person that i was 10 years ago and the answer is very straightforward if we took a hash of me right now again it's a hy hypothetical thought experiment and if i if i could if i had a hash of myself 10 years ago although the hashes would be different because i'm a different person because the structure and personality changes through time it would not be same but it would be similar 
So same, sameness, can, uh, sameness can be expressed not only with, uh, with equality, but also with a similarity function. And when I was thinking about this, then I had the question, uh, question of how identity relates to name. And I thought that my name is my identity. But then I started to question that when I started to ask myself, what happens when you change your name? Do you also change your identity or your identity stays the same? And to give you a good example, let's look at this famous guy. Probably all of you know him, but you know him as Freddie Mercury, not as Farah Gulzara. But actually, that's his birth name. Uh, uh, through a series of changes, he f firstly, he changed his first name to Freddie, and then when he joined Queen, he also changed his last name to Mercury. So the question is following. When you change your name, do you alter your personality? Are you some, somebody else? And to me, the answer is very straightforward. No, it's the, it's the same person. Just by changing your name doesn't mean you change your identity. So, uh, I came to a conclusion that name and identity are orthogonal and they are different things, although sometimes they can be same things. And I would argue that it actually in tech world, uh, intertwining and making name uh, identity is very useful and I'll give, you a, uh, I'll give you an analogy. So, a few weeks ago, me and my friend, we were working on a web application and we had a problem. So we had our JavaScript build pipeline and we were generating one master file, of course called all.js. And then we started to use Cloudflare. What Cloudflare is, it's a very useful service. It's, uh, it's a cloud service that gives you a reverse proxy, SSL support, it gives you CDN, uh, caching, all the goodies. So the problem was very simple. Every time we changed the JavaScript file, the ca we would end up with, uh, with a stale cache. So we would have results that were outdated and we somehow had to deal with it. The first natural solution was to, uh, was to disable caching for development purposes, uh, and that's actually what my friend proposed. And I said, you know what, maybe we're approaching this problem the wrong way and we should change, our, uh, change the way we approach the problem. So I proposed something different. Instead of using same name for different files, like all JS, I proposed that we would use a hash of each file as its file name, so we would, we would compute the hash of each JavaScript file and we would call it as its file name. And now the problem is that we, uh, now that we don't have the caching problem anymore because every time we change something, we end up with something new because it's, it, has, it has name which happens to be identity and therefore you will never end up some, with something that is stale. Uh, so uh, so uh, the rule from, uh, the, the lesson that I learned from this experience was don't cache memoize. And I'll explain what memoization is. It comes from maths and it comes from functional programming. It, uh, and it means something very simple. So if you have a pure function that has no observable side effects, uh, let's say exponentiation. We know that if you raise two to the power of 10, it's always going to be 1024. That's a fact that will never change. It's gonna be like this forever. We can leverage that information and we can save that. So instead of every time computing the value, we can save that value. So the difference between memoization and caching is very simple. We memoize things that never change, but we cache things that can change. So if I'm caching a user object from a database, I will always run with stainless problem because somebody might change the user object without me knowing, knowing about it first. But if you memoize things, you will never have, uh, you will never have inconsistency problems. Now to move on, uh, I, was thinking, I was thinking about code and structure and then I started to think, uh, think bigger. I started to zoom out. And I asked myself the question, how does company structure ac actually influence the code structure? It was a very simple and straightforward question but the answer was quite surprising. So when I started Googling, I immediately found out about Convoy's law which is very simple. It says that the company structure directly influences the code structure. And I'm not really sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a double-edged sword. If you work in a company whose processes are very well defined and business people actually know what they're doing and, they're, and they, they are familiar with the, the domain problems and they're solving them efficiently, even if you don't put a lot of effort, you will end up with, some, with, you will end up with a code structure that's very, uh, that's very neat, very cleanly organized and easy to handle. But on the other hand, if you're a very good engineer and if you work in a company whose processes are not so well defined, where things are changing all the time uh, and you have no idea what's gonna happen next, no matter how hard you try, you will end up with something that's almost impossible to maintain. So this begs a very, very interesting question. 
uh, I, would, I would encourage each and every one of you to think about this question. Do you like the structure of your company? Because depending on the answer you get, you have to act accordingly. If you, if you, real, if you like the company that you work on, the structure and their culture, you should consider yourself lucky. And unfortunately, if we look statistically, good things only last for a while. So we should enjoy it while it lasts. But I think most people would answer that they don't like the, don't like the structure of the company. And the next question is that, what should you do about it? And we branch in two as well, and we have two, two ways. One thing is to try to be naive and try to change the company, or the other one is to move on. I think uh, uh, a person who, who's just one person who thinks that they can change the company structure and company uh, culture on its own is most likely naive or delusional, depending on your definition. Just because if a company is big enough, let's say more than 20 people, let's say 50, 100, or God forbid, 1,000, company has its own soul. It's a machine on its own and it has its own rules and changing that, that huge machine is almost always impossible unless you have a lot of dedication and you have a lot of influence. So unless you're the CEO of the company or, or you're very high in top management and you're not satisfied with your company, I think the more logical solution is to move on and find something else. But even finding something else can be sometimes tricky. And some people ask the question, what if I don't like the structure of any company? What should I do in that case? And the answer is simple, but it's very difficult to actually implement. You should start your own business, but honestly, I would recommend doing, it, you know, doing this to everybody. It's extremely hard. Uh, a lot of people like the whole startup culture and they think starting your own company is a good thing. It's very easy. But I think that the most things that I've learned is that when you, st when you start about, when you st start your own company, you just make a lot, a lot of mistakes. And you think you solved one problem, but after solving that problem, it's like, it goes, grows exponentially. So it's really hard. So unless you, are, you have a lot of perseverance, unless you're very sure about what you're doing, unless you're very good at what you're doing, unless you, you're prepared to go through blood, sweat, and tears, I would recommend again starting your own business. It's extremely, extremely hard, and chances of you succeeding is close to zero. So the next thing, uh, next question that I had when I had this thought process was that I realized that uh, although there are different industries, sometimes the problems are similar but not quite the same. And I asked myself, is there a way we can leverage information from one domain to another? If I'm a good physical uh, structural engineer, does, can I leverage that information to become a good structural engineer in tech? And I was surprised. I thought, thought about it for a while and I came to the conclusion that it, it's possible but it's hard. So I want you to emphasize on two people, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. I, I, I'm sure you, all of you know who these people are. And I want to emphasize on a very simple thing. Steve Jobs started his own company, Apple. Then he was fired from his own company and started Next. Then he started Pixar. Pixar is not a tech company. Well, they're a tech company, but they do animations. So although it's similar, it's quite different at the same time. And then he came back to Apple as a CEO. And even if you look within Apple, iPhone, iMac, and iPod were three completely different products. So what this person demonstrated was that you can be successful not only in one field or one discipline, but in many fields at the same time. Same is true for Elon Musk. During dot-com bubble era, he, he founded PayPal, then he got involved in Tesla and SpaceX. He, now he's doing things in OpenAI. He's all over the place. Uh, so what these people have demonstrated is that success is not accidental. It's something you can, you can achieve over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, the, the reason why they were so successful was that it's a cliche, but they saw things differently. Uh, they could see through uh, the structures and as if they were wearing like x-ray glasses. So they saw things that most people just ignored and they had no respect for status quo. They were building what they thought was right, but not what their competitors were doing. After searching for this, I came to a very, very, very interesting uh, topic. It's called Kerry Howard Lambeck isomorphism. It's a very technical thing, but I'm just going to talk about it very, very briefly. So what it basically means is that three fundamental disciplines in math and computer science are equivalent. 
So logic, informatics, and category theory are the same thing. What that means is that what you can prove with logic, you can prove the same thing with informatics, and you, you can prove the same thing with category theory. It's very interesting, and that begs a very, another interesting question. Since we found three different ways to represent things, is math discovered or is math invented? I'm a strong proponent of, uh, of an idea that math is actually discovered, not invented. Obviously, the no notation, the base 10 system, and th those things, we came up with it, but the fundamental laws of math is fundamental property of our universe, and we just were lucky enough to discover it. And the interesting consequence is following. So that basically, this isomorphism basically means that computer programs are same things as math mathematical proofs. So when you're writing software, you're actually proving something. So when you're writing a function, the function type is a hypothesis, and the function implementation is actually the proof, that, a proof of that hypothesis. So actually, uh, the, uh, when I ask the question, can we, translate, uh, can, can we translate from one industry to another, the answer is very simple. Yes, we can, and this isomorphism is a very good example of it. Uh, so, uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, how can we? is knowledge from one industry to another. Uh, and then the, the next thing I want to talk about is communication. It may seem very random, but it's, it's, it's very closely connected to the structure. Because uh, if, we want, if, you want to, if we want to have a successful system, different pieces have to interact with each other, so we need an effective way to communicate. And this raises a question. When we write code, do we write code for computers or for people? And I would argue that we exclusively write code for people, and sometimes we write it for computers. Because when you write, a, when you write code, you think about decomposition, you think about good functional variables, you think about comments. Those are three things that compilers and interpreters just ignore. So when we write code and when we write structured data, it's, it's, we are trying to communicate with each other. So tech industry has a lot of culture trying to communicate and trying to, expressing, trying to express, express the intent. Uh, and the, the, the next thing that I sometimes hear and I just want to emphasize is that there are a lot of people who think that engineers are very geeky and anti-social people. And I would argue that actually it's the exact reverse. Engineers are very social because they need to be very social. They cannot be successful in their own fields if they cannot communicate with their peers. I agree that there are cases where some engineers, not a lot, and the number is going down very, very rapidly. There are some engineers who have sometimes difficulty communicating with, let's call it, the rest of the world, non-engineer, non-techie people. But I think that's changing, and like in 70s and 80s, maybe it was true that most people, most engineers were, did not shave or something, but I think it has changed and we've, we've passed that point a long time ago. The other thing I want to emphasize is that during a com communication, there are actually two different dimensions that sometimes people do not pay attention, but they intuitively always use. Is that emotion and reason are two separate things. When you're trying to convince somebody, you can use two mechanisms. One is that I'm, I'm saying this thing is good because, because this, that, and so on. I'm using arguments. But I might say that this thing is good because it's beautiful, because you will like it. You, it's a completely different realm. Uh, and if, if uh, people who can actually mix and match those two things are shown to be more, more successful in life. And actually, I would argue that in most cases, emotions are more important than reason. And if you look at cognitive psychology, it has been shown time and time again that when people are making decisions, they're not making decisions based on reason. They're making decisions based on emotion. Uh, and when they, when, when, they, they, when they want to make that decision, they're trying to find reasons so to rationalize those, that decision. So uh, I want to get back to where I started. So uh, 10 years ago, the other question that I had during an interview was that, what do you like? And I said, I like communicating with people and computers, but I said interacting with computers is much easier than interacting with people just because computers are much simpler. And I still think that it's very true. So I've been trying to improve my communication skills for the last 10 years. And I think I've gone a long way. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's extremely hard. 
I sometimes spend hours and hours talking to people not in our industry about simple things. I'm sometimes installing a proper font or a keyboard is more than enough for them to be happy. I'm trying to explain to them why this thing is good or useful. Like, um, I, I have a lot of friends who are big proponents of Docker, uh, and they're trying really hard to push Docker in the, in the, in the industry and in the production, and they, they somehow get pushed back from management. And I think in most cases, the approach they're taking is quite wrong. They're trying to convince managers why Docker is good and the arguments they use, oh, Docker is good because it uses Linux C group because, uh, because it's, uh, it's like, uh, it, it, it uses this or it uses that. It's like very technical and very difficult to grasp for, for a manager. But if you explain that if we use Docker, First of all, our production pipeline would be easier. We would, uh, we would need less people to hire. That means that less people to manage, more money to be spent on other things. Our infrastructure would become simpler. That's that uh, we would have less operational costs. If, we, if you phrase, phrase the arguments that way, it's more understandable. So whenever you, you're talking to a person, you should understand what is the language that are, they are talking. And instead of using your own language, you, sh you should talk to their language and explain with the analogies, words, and examples that they will understand. Because although a Linux terminal can be good, al although uh, this can be good or that can be good, and it might be very precious to you, you might have a lot of emotional attachment, uh, some people just couldn't care less. So every time you try to communicate, you should try your best to talk to their language. Basically, this is all I had to say. Thank you for your time.